our current money system, does it work? Welcome to another episode of Understanding the Potential of Bitcoin, according to Dr. Seyfedin Amuz, and we're looking at this book, The Bitcoin Standard, The Decentralized Alternative to Central Banking. My name is Nikolai, and I'm basically trying to recapture the ideas and concepts of this book, because I think they are very helpful to understand why Bitcoin could actually become something very, very huge and very influential on society in general. We have um, basically looked at history retold through the lens of money in the last part and this time we want to talk about the current state of affairs. So this is basically government money we're dealing with right now. But in order to understand uh, our current money situation we first have to realize, according to uh, Dr. Amus, that this has not been the case for a long time. So we live in a time that is actually experimenting with something that has not been around for very long. And I think that's interesting because a lot of people just assume that's how it has always been. And we will find out in this part that a lot of things that we experience today are totally new and they are not necessary. So what is meant by government money? Well, government money basically is fiat money, which means it is a form of money that is decreed. There is an order to it. So it's not freely, freely chosen by market participants, but it is a decree, fiat from the Latin word. And um, there is a big difference between government money being redeemable in gold, which means you basically have a paper receipt that government or bank hand out, but you know you can always trade that receipt, that paper receipt, for a real piece of gold, which is a um, good that you know holds its value very well. Or the difference would then be a government money which is not redeemable in gold. It's basically just a paper of a piece of paper, but you cannot go to your bank or wherever and say, hey, I, for this piece of paper, I want that amount of gold. I want to redeem it into something else. And that's what we're talking about. A government money that is not redeemable in gold. First of all, um, Dr. Amuz looks at uh, part of the history. Uh, how this came about and uh, it's interesting that there was a actually uh, government money produced um, in uh, the Song Dynasty in the 10th century in, in China. Um, it's, it was called the Chiaozi, I don't know how to pronounce it, but um, it didn't work out really well. And then there was one other try where they did it um, that it was not redeemable into gold. And of course, it always leads to inflation because basically we have the same situation as we had. I don't know which part it is, but you have to look back um, talking about the glass bead situation in Western Africa. Of course, if you have the possibility to increase the production, if people want more of it, you will do it because it's just very, very profitable. And so you are basically back to a primitive form of money when you just have paper receipts because you can always just produce more paper. And this is kind of uh, the history that um, you easily lose the saleability um, um, if, if the thing gets overproduced and that means the destruction of purchasing power and that means the destruction of wealth. And we have seen that a lot of times in the last couple of decades and that is what he is discussing in this chapter 4 of his book. So um, he starts again with World War I um, and I find it interesting we have looked in the last part at history like on a broad uh, stroke um, um, until World War I and something changed in World War I. It's interesting how he um, sees the whole situation with World War I because he says well it was basically planned as just a quick affair. Um, some people in Britain uh, said it was, the, it was supposed to be a August bank holiday so you would just do it in a month the whole war. But something interesting and very, very powerful change during that era. And that was that um, the, the governments had the possibility for the first time, because they were not, uh, they were in charge of um, the, the banks, the central banks, and uh, handing out paper receipts uh, for the gold they, they still had at the time, they first had the possibility to increase those paper receipts more than they had backed by gold. So they could actually inflate their currency. 
And of course, that would mean that their um, purchasing power is not limited to the amount of gold they have, but it's actually limited to the wealth of their whole country, of all the people in the country, because they can now inflate, 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 and as long as people uh, trade these goods for that money, and that money of course loses value slowly, um, they can use that wealth that people have generated um, uh, for, for their purposes. And that meant in World War I, they could buy a lot of bombs and tanker, tanks and whatever. So um, the war got huge, it got bigger and bigger and bigger because people could buy, governments could buy things that they were um, not able to beforehand. They could issue more paper currency and that was just way too tempting. And it was of course better than taxing because if you would tax people and say, hey guys, we need more money, um, can you please help us out here? Um, then people would say, well, we don't want to give you that money because we don't think the war is uh, logical or uh, we don't want to give you that money for that. And they would revolt and they would uh, vote other politicians or um, kill the king. <laughs> yeah. But if you do it through inflation, people don't really realize it. And of course, you don't tell people. They just realize it slowly because the uh, money they use loses its purchasing power. But in the meantime, the government was able to buy more and more stuff um, for, uh, for the war. And so within a few weeks, basically all big players in World War I gave up on their gold convertibility. So they suspended the gold convertibility of their currency and they um, could just go like crazy. Their efforts were no longer limited to the money in treasuries, uh, but to the wealth of the whole population. Um, so that led to a war that lasted a lot longer than anyone expected. And the interesting thing is, if you look back at it, the results of that war, war weren't that huge. A lot of people don't understand why people, why they fought for so long. Um, and uh, there were not big um, geopolitical um, changes, geographic changes. Basically, a lot of uh, monarchies were ended and Republican regimes were installed. But in it, I think that is um, an interesting take by Dr. Amus that he says, well, the main difference between World War I and all the other wars before were not geopolitical, were not strategic, but the main difference was monetary. I have never thought of that before. I don't know what you think, but to think about World War I and its incredible um, uh, destructive power and why it took so long to realize, well, it has a lot, of, a lot to do with the change of monetary politics and the ability for governments to spend so much more. So after four years of the war, um, we had uh, the defeat of Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1917-1918. And uh, the currency of the value of the currency in Germany had dropped in only four years 50%. So you lost 50% of your wealth in four years through this war. Everything you saved up until then in that currency, in those paper receipts that you thought, well, they're backed by gold, so it's all good. And gold has shown its value for thousands of years. All of a sudden, you sit there after the war, everything destroyed anyways, but you lost 50% of your savings. And not because you messed it up, but because your government inflated um, your currency. So what should they do? That was a big question of the government. Should they admit that? Should they tell the people, well, yeah, um, we messed up? Um, and um, that would mean that uh, you had a fair market valuation and you would say, well, let's see how much um, you can actually, how much gold you can buy with our currency right now. What is the uh, existing stock of currency um, valued to the stock of gold and then you can know um, well 
we had a huge depreciation of the value of our currency, but then you have at least a, a good understanding of where the currency stands right now. But they didn't want that. They didn't want to um, admit and so they pretended that the currency's value remained at the pre-war level, which of course is really difficult because people in their day-to-day -day business uh, realize that you can't buy the same things with the same amount of money, so the prices were rising. Um, but um, uh, it was a very, very unpopular uh, admission and so they tried to get around it. So what happened is, um, the idea I rose, arose that you have to plan the whole uh, monetary system centrally. So um, uh, the economist Hayek called it, it was the rise of monetary nationalism. Because in, all of a sudden um, they said, well, we cannot make, give market participants the right to freely choose um, what they use as a medium of exchange. And it has always been the case in history that people used um, the, uh, the, a medium of exchange that was the most saleable. So it, you could sail it across time, it holds its value well, you could sail it across space, you can uh, transport it well, and you could uh, sail it across scales, so you could divide it well, right? But they said, no, 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 we have to do the planning, the value, the supply, the interest rates for money centrally by national governments. And that was a huge change. Um, through, uh, compared to everything that was uh, beforehand. And it um, had a lot to do, according to Dr. Moose, with um, not wanting to admit what happened during World War I. So international meetings were organized, agreements were made, and one uh, important figure um, showed up. And this is, of course, John Maynard Keynes, a um, I, he says he didn't even, uh, Dr. Mu says that he didn't even study um, uh, economic, economics, so I don't know too much background about him, I just know how influential he is, Keynesian um, uh, theory of economics um, is of course around everywhere. But Keynes came up and he basically captured that zeitgeist very well, um, in that he said, well, this is exactly what we need to do. Governments need to be in control and especially the state of the economy is determined by the aggregate spending. So he basically pushed the thesis that all problems can be solved by just spending more, which means the free pass to inflate because when you inflate, you are able to spend more. And that means the remedy is always an increase of government spending. If the economy is going bad, if uh, unemployment is high, it's not about looking at the root cause for these problems, but it's just you need to spend more, right? And we live in a time where this is just so normal that everybody thinks, well, when the economy is going bad, we need to incentivize more spending. And it's, it's just fascinating because I feel like nobody in their, in their own um, personal lives uh, lives like that. It's, at least you, if you do, you get punched in the face really bad. If you really in a bad economic situation yourself at home, you don't have enough money to buy new shoes and, and to afford your college education or whatever, your next idea is not, I have to spend more. I have to get more money and spend more so I can solve that problem. I think your natural inclination is, well, I need to save more. I need to be more careful with spending so I don't uh, go deeper into that hole. But on a macro level, our governments are doing exactly the opposite. They're just spending more and more and more and more. And it's absolutely normal for us to hear that uh, the governments are making, uh, getting more debt and more debt every year and that's how they finance the whole um, economy. And that all goes back to the Keynesian idea that um, the remedy is government spending and uh, the economy is determined by the level of aggregate spending. And that means of course that saving reduces spending and therefore it's bad. 
which I don't know on a on a micro level, individual level, I think uh, it's it's very uh, contraintuitive and illogical. But on a macro level, it's the best answer any government could hope for. This um, uh, led to also an interesting observation by Keynes himself when he translated his book in 1937 into German, um, and that was the height of uh, the Nazi era in Germany. He said something really interesting about this idea that he had and which is so popular uh, today. Um, and he, he, he said, the theory of aggregate production, which is the point of the following book, nevertheless can be much easier adapted to, condition, to the conditions of a totalitarian, sorry, totalitarian, to a totalitarian state than the theory of production and distribution of a given production put forth under conditions of free competition in a large degree of laissez-faire. So he's basically saying, my thesis works the best with a totalitarian regime. They can just um, uh, decree that and therefore it will go much faster. And that's actually exactly what happened. Um, the question is just, was it good for the society? And his uh, thesis is that it wasn't. Um, the notion that government management of the economy is necessary um, is just the basic starting point now for all modern economic education. This is something that is very, very um, unquestioned that we need government management of economy, we need uh, central planning and uh, I just always want to think about stuff in a new way and um, I find it a fascinating thought to uh, to think about that this is absolutely new idea um, related to medium of exchanges, use of money, um, trade, that um, we have a central planning doing that and the track record is not that great for that. So what happened after World War II then basically is um, a, a very important meeting um, of the uh, victors and their allies, so the United States, and they met in Bretton Woods. Um, Bretton Woods is a technical term for a big change um, because they um, decided some very, very important uh, things on, on the economy. They met in New Hampshire in, in the United States, and of course the um, for Britain, uh, John Maynard Keynes was the main uh, guy who uh, did that deal. And they basically introduced a new global trading system. They thought, well, how can we plan this all? And they came up with the idea that the USA, the United States of America, is the center of global monetary, uh, is the global monetary center. And that means the dollar should be used everywhere as the global reserve currency by other central banks. So they should not use gold anymore. They should not be on gold and uh, handing out paper receipts and checks um, because they are redeemable in gold, but they should hold dollars. So that means that um, every currency should be convertible to dollars at a fixed exchange rate. Fixed, you can already guess that that's almost not possible, but we'll see that in a second. And um, the idea was that the security for all the other countries, um, because they would give up their gold, um, give it to the, um, to the central bank of, of the United States, that the dollar was convertible to gold at a fixed rate. So you had the idea, I don't know, central bank of France, you hold your reserves in dollar, but you know the dollar it itself is convertible to gold in a fixed rate. And so what happened was a process that people, countries were selling their gold and um, the fixed rate that you could get for gold was per one ounce, $35. So that was how much the dollar was worth because you would measure the worth against gold. And so for one ounce of gold, you would get $35. Of course, in practice, that didn't work out. There were not fixed exchange rates and um, so they realized quickly that they needed something to organize that and they established the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. 
And the IMF basically um, wanted a global coordination between central banks. So they should um, care for stabili stability, uh, that we have a, a fixed rate of exchange between different currencies and so on. But of course, um, the fluctuation of national currencies uh, related to the value of dollars was a big um, factor and that always caused a problematic dynamic that we still have to deal with today a lot of times that when a uh, currency devalues then uh, the whole uh, dynamic gets increased that it gets devalued more and more and more it depreciates more and um, you have to do something against it. It, basically, you, you don't have a constant measuring rod against which all economic activity can be measured. Because now you have the dollar, um, but it wasn't stable anymore. The US Federal Reserve was the world's central bank. And, um, uh, and something interesting happened by doing that. Uh, of, of course, the United States and its allies won World War II, but they were put in a very, very special position. Think about it. They had, as the only country in the world, the right and the ability to just print more money and everybody used their currency as um, as their reserves. So they were able not just to um, spend the worth of the wealth of their population, but basically of the whole world, because they could inflate it to that degree. What, I mean, what he means by that is, if you look at it today, how much, is, how much can you get for one ounce of gold? Back then it was $35. Today, it's about $1,200. You have to pay $1,200 for one ounce of gold. That tells you that the dollar depreciated incredibly since then. And that means why did the dollar depreciate? Well, because there is more supply of it. They increased the supply. They got to printed more money and more money and more money. And of course, it's so tempting to do it. Um, but that was the a very, very special position uh, for the United States of America. And um, he says, well, they were able to buy a lot of free lunches. And of course, ignore the law of economics. Now, they still had one problem though. Um, and up until 1968, um, the, there, there was a revaluation of the dollar against gold and you could see that the diminishing purchase power, purchasing power of, uh, uh, of the dollar um, became clear and of course that affected all the other central banks and therefore all the national banks and therefore all people around the world because you could buy less and so all your savings were not worth that much, you wouldn't save as much, blah blah blah. So. The problem is it became apparent and up until, up until that point they couldn't inflate it to the nth degree because as you remember one rule in Bretton Woods was that the dollar had to be convertible to gold. You always needed to be able uh, to convert the dollar back to redeem um, uh, your dollar for gold. And so what they said is after looking at uh, the situation in 1968, oh, um, a lot of countries realized, no, 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 this doesn't work, we want our gold back. And so, for example, uh, Charles de Gaulle, the president of France back then, uh, he sent a military carrier uh, to the United States to get like tons of gold back because they realized that this doesn't work. And then Germany started and said, we want to repatriate our gold. And basically that was the point where it was where the United States says enough and then Richard Nixon in 1971 you have to remember that date 1971 he made a huge decision he basically said this is the end of dollar convertibility to gold from now on the dollar is not convertible to gold anymore so now you basically have nothing as a backup you just have the goodwill of governments 
and saying, well, we abstain from printing too much money because um, we know that wouldn't work out and you, w you wouldn't trust us. But there's always national emergencies, there's always economic recessions or whatever. So there's always reasons why, yes, we have to give out more bonds. Therefore, uh, we get more money, uh, we can print more money. Um, and, and that's exactly what happened. It basically freed them from all constraints and there was immediately, in the years after 1971, a large drop of purchasing power of the dollar. And all prices rose across the board. It's so interesting because when you grow up in a time like, in my generation, it's just normal that you think, well, prices just rise. That's how it is. Inflation, of course, when 20 years ago, everything was a lot cheaper. Now it's more expensive. You don't think about that this has a source. Like, how does this all work? Well, somebody somewhere has printed more money <laughs> and therefore there is more supply out there and therefore the one little piece that you have of that supply is worth less. And then the question is, well, do you actually want that? Do you want someone to print more money when they want to? And what does that mean for your production of wealth? How can you make sure that the effort you put into things actually gets stored and doesn't lose its value just because somebody else decides to print more money. So this is what happened and um, now, of course, after uh, leaving the gold conver uh, convertibility, you now had um, the utilization of more than one medium of exchange. Now you had national currencies everywhere um, that had a different value um, compared to each other and that of course um, uh, led to the rise of the global exchange, foreign exchange market. Yeah? Uh, you have to think about it, the daily volume of just the foreign exchange trade market, so basically tra exchange trading currencies like when you go to an airport or whatever, the, um, the daily volume is five thousand billion dollars five trillion every day is just um, moved around every single day between different currencies so this is like a huge step back because it means that every seller when you want to sell something you can't just go to um, uh, somebody and give them uh, your good but you have the lack of coincidence of wants, which we talked about in part one, how money works. You can check that out. Um, which means is you have something, but your buyer doesn't want that. He wants a different medium of exchange. He doesn't want your Turkish Lira. He actually wants Euro. So what do you have to do? Well, if you want to uh, sell it to him and he wants Euro, you first have to exchange your Turkish Lira to Euro and then you can um, trade with that person. And I think uh, that makes things incredibly uh, complicated, first of all, because you always have that middle step. It's so much easier if just everyone uses the same medium of exchange and it's so much quicker. And the, the biggest problem, and I heard, he doesn't write about it a lot in this book, but I heard in uh, some podcasts that he did is, you have to realize how, um, how much businesses are affected, not by how well they're planning, how well they're doing, how, how they produce their products, how they market and everything, but how much they are affected just by the foreign exchange market and the valuation of the currency, so, which they have no control over. He then introduced introduces a very interesting statistic uh, issued by the World Bank. So from 1960 to 2015, the average growth rate across all the currencies is 32.16%. That is a lot. So the increase of supply um, is huge. Um, of course, the, the big currencies, the major currencies, um, their increase was less, especially in the last 20 years, 1990 to um, 2015, it was around 5%. But if you think about what that means, it means 
if something grows at a rate of 5%, every 15 years, the money supply doubles. Now, um, if you compare that to maybe the stock to flow ratio of gold, where we talked about it's about 1.5%, very stable, that is okay. But as soon as you have something doubling in its amount every 15 years, you can just witness how um, its value decreases. He then talks about hyperflation in general and um, it, hyperinflation is defined by something having a 50% increase in price over the period of a month. And I wasn't aware of that, but you have since World War II, 56 occurrences of hyperinflation. Now, hyperinflation is just a word, but if you think about what it means, it is very, very destructive. It means that all your effort, all your work, everything you invested, energy and so on, you try to save for yourself, your family, for future generations, and so you put it in money or you put it in a bank account. But then there comes something like hyperinflation and what happens is you witness the destruction and the disappearance of all your savings in the front of your eyes within a couple of weeks. That is what, what inflation, hyperinflation actually is. You just watch how everything gets destroyed that you worked for hours and hours and months and years. And not only that, it also means the complete breakdown of the structure of economic production. Think about it that way. If you have a hyperinflation, everything just breaks down like in Venezuela right now. Yeah, you can watch it. Uh, you, you see the images of the supermarkets and everything is empty. Why is that? Well, because if you have a collapse of money, it is impossible to trade. It is impossible to pay people because you, you uh, uh, define a wage, but a week later, the currency is worth half as much. So you need to increase the wage, but you didn't make that much money. So what happens is more and more goods uh, go out of service. It gets more and more basic. You get back to a very barbaric level in the end. All luxury goods go first and then all of these other extra things that you took for granted for a long time, they just disappear. So the whole economy collapses and there's no incentive to produce anymore and all of a sudden you witness that you had a lot of good things beforehand that you weren't aware of that only worked because you had a stable, hard medium of exchange, you had a store of value, you had a unit of account that people could work with. And when that disappears through hyperinflation, it is very, very bad. Now this uh, situation, this horrible situation of hyperinflation happened 56 times since World War II. Now, if you think about um, how used we are to these cases in Turkey now and Zimbabwe and wherever, it seems like, well, this has always been like that. But then uh, he asks, how many times did that happen before World War II? And it's exactly once. Um, 1795, there was an incident. But uh, other than that, <clears throat> there are not known examples of hyperinflation because you didn't have the, um, the money system that supports such a hyperinflation and therefore a huge list of um, problems just didn't, exi didn't exist before. And I, I find that uh, very, very noteworthy and something to think about is that the kind of um, system we want to live with. Of course, something else happens when hyperinflation happens and there's no goods anymore in the supermarket, there's no trade going on, people are unemployed, um, it gets very bad. People look for a scapegoat. And every time that happens, you find some politicians or some authoritative figure who says, well, I found the scapegoat, this person or this industry or this system or whatever and they get elected and a lot of times out of hyperinflation doesn't arise a new great regime but a totalitarian uh, regime who um, actually uses that um, situation for their means. To sum it up, government money and the current monetary system has a huge, pro has a huge problem. It has the problem that there is a single point of failure which is the hardness of money 
depends on the ability of the people in charge not to inflate. So we all depend on one party or one government or we, we depend on a few people and we trust them that they don't inflate the currency, which they have shown time and time and time again that they do when they need to. But there is a single point of failure and we are all depending on it. And so that is a huge problem with the money system right now, that there is no reliance um, and no uh, security. And of course, the temptation is huge to just inflate and print more money when you need it. On, on this aspect, he starts on a side note talking about Bitcoin um, and we will get to that in a second. But another uh, huge point of um, the problem is that, of course, the winners are not only the people in charge, the government, because they can just pretty much do whatever they want because they can finance all of their activities. They don't need to uh, uh, get uh, very, very unpopular tax rises, which is very hard to push through. They can just inflate the money. So slowly the value decreases. Um, of course, that's good for them. But also everyone gets favored who is close to the government, rich, or just has good access to government credit. Why? Well, he explains that, of course, in inflation, the point is this, the person who spends the money first has the best opportunity. Um, and then the person who spends the money after the first person, the value decreases, the value decreases, the value decreases. So the last person who gets the money um, has a lot less purchasing power with the same amount of money. So the ones who are easy um, or who, the ones who spend it first uh, have a great deal and those are usually the ones who get the government credits. They are the ones who get the money first. The worst of are the ones uh, with fixed incomes or minimal wages, so a lot of poor people, um, uh, they get the money last and then the money, money is less uh, valuable. It is interesting not only to see what happens uh, when somebody has the possibility to produce more of a store of value, it's also interesting to see what happens if that ability gets taken away. And by accident, that happened a couple times. For example, in 2003, when the United States uh, were in war in Iraq, they destroyed the central bank of Iraq. And overnight, the Iraqi dinar rose in value immediately. Why? Well, because people realized they, the Iraqi uh, central bank can't just produce more Iraqi dinar and therefore the supply is scarce and therefore it's more valuable. That's how value is um, working. <laughs> but it also shows, because it didn't rise beforehand, that people knew, well, they can always print more. Um, same happened with the Somali shilling. The last question is, why then with all these disadvantages and all of these problems, why do we still have government money? Why do we have paper receipts not backed by anything, but just uh, hoping it'll all work out? And he um, lists a few reasons. Well, number one is our taxes have to be paid in uh, our national currency. So, of course, even if I want to use a different currency, in the end, I need to have enough euro to pay my taxes. Number two, the banks uh, open accounts in the national currency and they only transact money in the national currency. Of course, you can already see a little bit about Bitcoin again. If you can transact and open accounts in a different currency that holds it value better, is a more um, saleable good, well, that has a lot of advantages. But right now, nationally, the banks can only open accounts in their currency, in the national currency. And then number three, of course, are legal tender laws, that it's just oftentimes illegal to use a different form of currency. And what happens, he, he lists an example, um, how that affected people when government can just um, decree certain decisions about money. In 2016, so not long ago, in India, the government just suspended um, the legal tender status of 500,000 rupee notes. So they overnight just said, well, those are not... Um, value, they, they, they cannot be used anymore. So everybody who had 500,000 uh, rupee notes just lost all the value they had. And that is because somebody else could decide that um, by legal tender law. Now, 
this uh, points to the problem that you have a monetary good that is depending on a third party. It's not between seller and buyer and you have a medium of exchange so you don't have the problem of uh, uh, lack of coincidence of wants but you actually can just trade with the person because you have agreed upon a certain medium of exchange. Now you have a third party, the government, we, who can just uh, step in and uh, destroy that whole process if they want to. Um, either by taking away the value or by making uh, certain laws. And so uh, Dr. Moose says there has actually now been for the first time a, another criterion added to the saleability of a good. So uh, since uh, a long time we had the saleability across scales, across time and across space. And now he says we also have the saleability of money um, according to the will of holders. So the question is now also, is it possible to sell this good according to my will? Or do I have to take into account the will of third parties, banks, governments? And of course, a medium of exchange that I can exchange freely according to my will is more saleable and therefore more valuable than a medium of exchange that is not able to do that. And here he talks about Bitcoin again, that this is a huge part of Bitcoin, that there is no third party involved. And people will, that's his thesis, eventually choose the medium of exchange that is the most saleable. And the most saleable is connected to not being restrained um, by third party decisions. That is only one aspect of Bitcoin, but here you can also see how it comes into play. All right, uh, this was uh, uh, a little longer, but I find it very interesting because this is our present day and so many of the things he talks about um, I wasn't aware of because I thought it's just normal, that's just how it is. But that's what education does, you, you start um, seeing things in a new way and you get new thoughts. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I just want to ask you if you enjoyed the episode and you uh, have some uh, ideas and comments, please share them because I'm no expert and I'm doing this to learn. I'm doing this to, to understand these concepts more fully and right now there's not a lot of people commenting or watching which is okay but I would actually like to have some discussions. I would like to have some disagreements or some hey this is exactly what I think or whatever. Um, so please share the video if you think it's helpful and uh, let's get some uh, discussions going. Already looking forward to the next part. Have a good day. Bye.